Hello, I'm Starlick Williams, and I'm from Mickey Leland College Preparatory Academy for Young Men, and today we're at U of H to interview Dr. Virgil Aidwood. Good morning, my name is Alexander Randon, and yes, I also want to thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate this opportunity to gain some wisdom from a fellow African American such as yourself. Thank you so much. I, I know that uh, you were an ordained minister at a fairly young age. Yes. But um, I, other than that, where did you see yourself at my age? At, at your age? Yes. Okay, at 16. At 16, I was uh, a junior in high school, it's a little county high school in Virginia, segregated. I was, I was a bus driver, too. Uh, um, in terms of, also that was a year that my high school principal took me to an NACP youth convention. She took two students, Mrs. Mirka Agria, one of my um, dear, dear mentors. Um, and so I was already involved in terms of my school, you know, activity. Um, and then, of course, with the community. And I was uh, also the janitor of my own church at the same time. Um, my father had allowed me to uh, get my driver's license. I think I was 15 probably when I got my driver's license, but let me drive his car and all of that to do certain things that he, he didn't care to do anymore. Um, I would say that at that point in my life, I was, I was deeply influenced. I, I was also part of a, a singing group, a quartet. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we were trained by a man who had been uh, at Hampton University and had been a part of the Hampton University, you know, Hampton and Tuskegee, or the Booker T. Washington, um, you know, products. Uh, and um, they had kept alive the spiritual music tradition of our people. So at 16, I was part of a singing group. My, my, my older brother was the bass. I was the, <laughs> I was the lead singer. And um, the two sons of the man who trained us, he'd been trained at Hampton, um, and also was a specialist in that music. His, uh, one of his sons was a baritone, and the other was a bass. Walter was my closest friend growing up. So I had a great kind of running buddy I had, um, I had a great relationship in terms of family. Uh, grew up on a small farm in Virginia, about 40 acres, that my grandfather had created. My grandfather was born, uh, Grandpa Alexander was born 15 years out of slavery, after slavery, 1880. He, had, he worked as a coal miner in West Virginia. We lived about 200 miles from there, but and he died at age 55, the year I was born, 1931. Um, so I would say that at 16, I, I, I kind of, as I think back on it, what, what is the meaning of my life? I think that I've had certain phases of my life where I, I was awakening. You know, you know, some people, you can sleepwalk through life. You can live, never wake up and die. Old age, and never woke up. You wake up, I think, to the challenges you have. I think you wake up to the people in your life who do things for you and with you that become part of you. And I always ask that question about grandma, for example. Because when I went to college next year, I went to college at 17. I graduated 1948, high school, went to college in 1948. And uh, that's part of the story. I won't, uh, I won't go beyond that right now except to say the impact of my grandmother on my life in and, and 1948. And I thought about that in 1973 when I got my doctorate from Harvard University. And the work I had done at Harvard uh, was based on something that I had heard her say. She would be at, at my, my mother father's dinner table once a week. And everybody had to see a Bible verse. I don't see with you. <laughs> Hers always was, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. That's a, very, that's a very powerful economic concept, and that's been my life work that played out through my work with King. And I had the opportunity to be asked 
to share advice on economic stuff. I'm kind of getting ahead of the story, but I'm, I'm just talking about when I was 16. I'd like to think that I had awakened to what my life, where my life could go, and, and whether it was people-based. My life was deeply people-based. And um, I just, uh, I'm just think about how grateful I was uh, at 16 to be awakened. Now, I think one of the things I would describe as being awake to life possibilities at 16, I think it was somewhere in that, maybe just before that, that I, one day I woke up and realized I had just completed something that I had started that was important. I didn't know whether I could do it or not. And then I had gotten to the place that I said, oh, wow, I did that, you know. Not out of pride, but just is some kind of saying, you do something else. <laughs> you know? I, I would say that that's the way I think about 16. Actually, it seems to me that there are four awakenings in life. The first is the uh, 1 to 18. That's when you learn the basics. The basics. 18 to 36, you're adding value to that. Many people are, are getting started in a, a career on a career track, or they're doing graduate studies. That's, that's value adding. And then the next phase is you make your mark. That's from 36 to 54. That's when you make your mark, I mean, ideally. And then from 55 to the rest of your life, what I would call generativity. You are passing on to people behind you whatever value you have in your life. You're helping people at 55 and on. You're helping people who are 18 and down, I'd say like that. That's the way I think about it anyway. And as I, I didn't realize for a long time, uh, Starling, that, uh, that I had had those awakenings. And I'd be doing the commencement address at Virginia Tech next week, next Thursday. Major uh, mainstream university that has seen the value of my work and they want to, uh, I'll be, I'll be uh, doing the commissionment address for the whole graduate school, all of the graduate school, right? I have 10 minutes. But I just thought about the awakening, and my subject is going to be awakenings. I'm talking about the four awakenings in life. And, uh, and for me, the first 16 years, I really think I was by 18, I think I was pretty much awakened and ready to be grateful and my grandmama gave me a gift when I was, went to college that uh, I, I'm looking to get to heaven. I don't know where I'm going to go when I leave here, <laughs> well, up or down, I don't know. But I hope I get to heaven. There's a lot of people I still need to thank some more. And my grandmama is one of them. So what I heard is, like, like in the midst of being uh, the janitor at your church and, like, a bus driver, like, uh, a lot of things happen like up to like the point when you reach 16 like, when you like reach that awakening like was there a like, specific event that that sparked this awakening in you I uh, know I, well, I think it's a series of events the way I would describe it just to summarize I believe what I was saying was I had a community a family and a community that gave me latitude to become who I was who I was, and and held me responsible for my decisions. That's the way I would summarize what I, I, I just said to you. They allowed me to ex extend the boundaries of my own freedom within a context and within boundaries, so that I, you know, I I was a I was a poor farmer. <laughs> uh, I I had to I had to carry out my responsibilities on the farm. Uh, under my father's uh, belt, you may know may, may not know what I'm talking about, but when you're given an assignment and you're somewhere entertaining the neighbors rather than doing your assignment, and Daddy gets home at five o'clock and you haven't done in the garden what he showed you, want you to do in the morning, and he, well, as soon as he arrives and sees that you haven't carried out your assignment, you hear Virgil. Oh my God, I'm sitting on the neighbor's porch entertaining them, right? <laughs> and I've been troubled. Five minutes later, the na neighbors hear me screaming like I'm dead, dying or something from the whip. But I became a reluctant good farmer under the lash of my daddy, who loved me enough to allow me to do as much as I would be responsible for. 
uh, and it was important to the life of our family because it contributed to our family survival. We raised every vegetable we ate all the year. We had chickens and uh, ducks and uh, cows and all that stuff. Part of the self-sufficiency that I was a part of growing up. And then that, that helps me to understand also why it is possible to feed every soul, Martin Luther King, feed every soul on the planet. He said it at Oslo. Uh, I have a audacity to believe that we can feed every soul on the planet. Three meals a day and all of that. That's been my work and I've validated it at Harvard in my studies. I did my doctorate in economics to go with my theology because uh, theology is no good without economics. Economics is no good without theology. It's a marriage and that's been my life work. So I, that's why I would sum it, summarize that part of it. And I would say the first part of my waking up part of my life, the first 18 years I was waking up essentially to appreciate the freedom I was given, but also a, a real sense of the responsibility that went with that, even when it, my daddy had to, <laughs> had to put some, some whips, whips on my behind, if you pardon that expression, uh, with his belt. It didn't happen long, because I, 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 I got this real smart real quick. <laughs> uh, growing up, because uh, I know you discussed and you talked about your father and your grandmother and how they kind of influenced your life. Was there an adult in your life that really influenced you and had a significant part on how you viewed the world and how you wanted to get involved in your work? Yes, I would say in the face of my life, um, um, th there's so many people along the way who who were doing significant things that didn't seem, you know, unusual, but it was because of who they were. I would name uh, some of my teachers. I, I was a president of, my, of the university that I attended, Virginia Union, uh, Dr. J.M. Ellison, who was the first black scholar to use the phrase beloved community that King talked about. He was the first among, if you look at the literature, he's the first one to use that phrase. Uh, and, and, and this year, uh, 19, uh, 2018, 50 years ago, he gave the speech, on which that was, uh, that was 1948, also the year I went to college. That's also the year that uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was killed, 1948. So there's a kind of a, you know, um, watershed thing going on there. I would still, I go back to my grandmother, I tell you now what she did when I went to college. My grandmother was a domestic. She worked for the white folks in the white folks' kitchen, right? Her salary in 48 was $15 every two weeks, right? It's hard to imagine it, but you could get bread, a loaf of bread for five cents then. So oh, you can yes, see that. My daddy bought a new car every two years, $600. Brand new car, $600. I didn't remember that, 1936 Plymouth, beautiful. $600 some dollars, <laughs> so you exceed it. But she would send me Every month, she would send me a letter. She would have a handwritten letter. She wrote cursive. I don't know where she got that, but she wrote cursive. She write me every month and put five dollars in there. Tell me she's praying for me, but put five dollars in there. Now here was my dilemma. I didn't need the money. I always worked two jobs. You know, I'm like the guy that said, "Man, you mean you don't have two jobs?" <laughs> you know that joke. Uh, I've always had. I've always. So I didn't need the money. But I, I had a dilemma because I didn't, I didn't want to say to her that what you're doing is not necessary. I don't want you to do that, Grandma. And, and I, just, I just felt there was something spiritual in that, and I didn't say that. I didn't do that. But here's what happened. I decided that the only way I could show folks at home that I really appreciated about it was to send home the best grades I could send. So I was transformed from a clown who had gotten into the university. If she hadn't done that, I'd still been a clown. I probably wouldn't even gotten through school. I became, I became a scholar, and it built from that. And I just think about that as a, there's a mystery to that. And I don't know if I did the right thing, but I still accept it. I always bought a book of some of what she sent me. But it was, it was like she was saying, I'm, I'm voting for you. I'm voting for you to be as great as you can be. That's the way I, I, I think about it. One other person I'd mention very fast is a man named Samuel Proctor, Dr. Samuel Proctor, who was Martin Luther King's big brother. 
who shepherded Martin Luther King in his development. King followed him in the same seminary he went to, the same graduate school at Boston University. And he was my mentor also. He, I, have, uh, I have a lot of mentors. He's one of my mentors. And he said something to me in 1981, on the 40th anniversary of my ordination into ministry. He was with me in my church and all. He said something to me that day that was so overwhelming that I could not even appreciate what he was saying. It was almost like I, it, it, I was at such a, a, a sleep, sleepwalking stage, although I had wakened to a certain degree. I could not even appreciate what he was saying. It was so amazing. It was almost like he was making fun of me. That's the way I felt, you know what I'm saying? It was almost like he was making fun of me. He wasn't making fun at all. He was, he was putting a crown over my head that as I grew, the crown would keep rising. That's what they say at Mohouse. Right? That's not my school, but Mohouse. I've right? done a lot of work in my school at Virginia Union. But when I lecture at Mohouse, they say, are you a Mohouse man? You know, Mohouse men think that, you know, Mohouse is the, all of it. I said, no, no. But uh, I'm going to tell you, one of the people who influenced me later is Benjamin Mays. Dr. Benjamin Mays is King's mentor and president of Mohouse from 1940 to 1967, something like that, in a way. And Mays is responsible for creating real black men. When I say real black men, I simply mean uh, people who will pay the price to really know what they claim to know and take it and make something happen that's important to King. There's a whole line of people he influenced that way. But I used to bring Dr. Mays to Boston. I was then a dean at Northeastern University. I wanted our students at Northeastern to know um, their history. They were not at an HBCU. They were going to miss some things. They'll get, so I think the HBCUs give us why we must do what we're talking about. But don't fool ourselves. I'm talking about TSU, Prairie View. Prairie View more now than Ruth Simmons is it's gonna, it's gonna do what I'm talking about now. But the HBCUs do more of the why, right? The mainstream universities have less of the why and more of the how. They got the technique and the technology. Our schools have the reason why, the dream, why we must do this, right? I don't care what's in your way, to hell with racism. That was the attitude of the old folks I grew up with. They didn't sit around moaning and complaining about racism. They said, to hell with racism. We got ours, you know, to hell with racism. We're not going to give racism power by stopping and arguing with it. We'll deal with that later, right? If you look at our history, from next year's 400th anniversary of black folks in America, right? 400 years, and we're still here. We're surviving, even when the government didn't want us to survive. We had no friends but ourselves. In fact, I like to say that black folks ain't got but one friend. We're not even friends of ourselves because we, you know, we work against our own interests when we know better. The only friend black folks got is Jesus. And the only person who will tell you that Jesus is the real deal is grandma. You had multiple people in your life that influenced you and just supported you throughout especially the tough challenges you had to go through, your grandma, mm -hmm. your mentors, and it kind of shows and establishes the connection that you had with Martin Luther King Jr. and how both of you had mentors and they supported you and allowed you to come to this, you know, this point that you're at today where you can say, I've done this and I've, I've helped, I've, I've given, I've put my heart into this and you've, it's just allowed me to be able to be able to take that information and just utilize it and pass it on to others, and that's really what I took from your explanation. Right, yes. I, I feel as though um, I've become a part of them, they've become a part of me. And that's a part that does not cease either with their passing. You know, there's a part of them that speaks to me speaks with you. as real as are sitting here talking, and it's something that they've said or done or something. I have one friend, I had another friend who's just a wonderful friend, uh, who would, every time you see, he'd say something, he would say something real humorous to you, like he would say, he walk, he were on faculty, he walk and he said, Wood, he said, Wood, you know you ain't no good, don't you? Right? <laughs> he would break out laughing. Now he's been dead about 20 years, and there's a depth of his friendship 
that warms my heart right now as though he was still here. His name is Dr. Thomas Holmes. Wonderful man. Just a sweetheart of a person. Everybody loved him, you know. And I've been blessed to have people in my life like that. The other thing I would, I would say, Alexander, is I have uh, found joy in meeting strangers and being able to ex uh, establish a rapport on the spot. People I've never known before. I'd go, I'd been in a restaurant down in the south somewhere, down south, right? I, Spirit says to me, there's these old four guys sitting over here. Every morning you see these senior retired men sitting over all this stuff. I'm in the deep, deep south. And I go over to the table and stand. They look up at me and say, what's this guy sitting And I, then I look at them and I say, how are the grandchildren? Right? <laughs> Within four minutes, we're in a deep conversation as though we are long lost friends. One guy said, no, but I said, you know, my grandson's going to see, I got this one who's you know, I'm not sure how we're going to get him through where we got to go. It just gives you an opportunity to do it to, I think, enjoy the connection we have with human. There's a, there is a connectivity in humanity that cannot be destroyed. I think that's probably part of what it means to, to have the image of God in us. The Bible talks about the imago dei, the image of God. I think the image of God means that there's something in us that's good that's true and beautiful, that cannot be destroyed. It can be defaced, it can be covered over with crud, but it can be destroyed. And I think what it is, it's almost, I, I think of it as an awakening of the soul, that when, when somebody says to me something that allows me to reflect back to them something of their goodness that I see, I see some of their goodness, even Trump, <laughs> even Trump, because we all have our horns and our halos. Everybody got horns, everybody got halos. <laughs> so the question is, as Abraham Lincoln says, the better angels of our nature, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to let the better angels of our nature come through. Doesn't always happen. I have, I have done things that where my horns took over. And five minutes later, I'm totally embarrassed and sorry and all of that. That's because I'm human. So I'm not better than anybody else. I'm not worse than anybody. I'm not better than Hitler. I'm not worse than Hitler. What's that thing that says, there's so much good in the worst of us, so much bad in the best of us, that it behooves none of us to talk about the rest of us. That's kind of the way I think about that piece in a way. And thank you so much for your question. Uh, throughout your journey, like throughout like, all the people you've met, all the people that like, influence you to do as you do today, um, is there anything that you've like learned like through like trial and error or like just through like the many experiences that you've had that you can teach us and like many other like people our age that yes. no one else can teach us? Um, I have found sometimes in my life when I've been up against a situation I said there's no way in the world I can handle this. I, I don't see any way I can handle it. I don't see where I have any understanding or resource by which I can get beyond this. And I'm right at the edge. Right, and um, what I've learned is that if you don't count yourself out and don't do anything to make the situation worse, that's where that's where faith for me comes out. That I'm trusting the goodness of the universe. I'll put it that way. But I'm really talking about the goodness of God, the reliability of goodness. When I wrote my book on my work with King. And I asked myself, I saw all those pictures where we were marching and stuff, and I asked myself, here we were on the edge. We were on the edge of ch challenging America to do what they said on paper. We were on the edge, right? And I said, why did we do that? After I wrote my book and all, thinking about King, I wrote that book in 05, published in 05. Uh, that was all these years after my work with King, and then reflecting on what I had learned from King, and the rest of us, but what I had learned from King, and I, I figured out that if you trust love, you won't always know how it's going to come out. But if you don't jump, or don't allow yourself to be pushed over the edge, if you have that attitude, what, what I found out is that at the edge, if you don't vote against yourself, don't vote against God, you, then you go over the edge and you fall into the arms of God. 
That's the only place that I've been able to get beyond things that were impossible for me. I've, I should have been in jail right now. I should be in jail right now. The evil of the system that's destroyed people. You know Martin Luther King was not only murdered, but his mother was murdered, assassinated also. I'm talking about when you're up against that kind of evil, you're going to find yourself at the edge. And it's important to say, don't make that worse. I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. Don't do anything to make it worse. And don't give up. Don't say, sometimes all you can do is say, God, I thank you for whatever this is. I don't understand it, but I thank you for putting this in my life. I don't know how it's going to come out. I don't know how to fix it. So you don't want to act like you know, because whatever you do is just going to make it worse. And you'll fall over the edge, but you won't fall into the arms of anything reliable. That's the way I think about it anyway. And I think if I were to uh, respond to this, a very profound question, if I were to respond to it any other way, I would be doing spiritual malpractice. And that's the one thing I determined not to do. Uh, what were some of the challenges that you had to overcome growing up? Because I know that you mentioned that you went to a segregated school. Right. How did that kind of go with your the the compounded experiences that you had to have in order to become the man that you are today? I ask myself that question sometimes, um, Alexander. Um, what is it that I was given out of as a result of all of the interactions with people and circumstances that would allow me to do something for my grand boys? Right, but all children. I, I have a movement that I've started. I call it Saving Every Child on Planet Earth. That's my work now. And what I'm doing is trying to wake up uh, communities. I believe if, if people know that the universe has every resource that every child can, can thrive, and also old folks can thrive, the universe has given us every resource necessary, so why are we not saving every child on planet Earth? That's my work right now. And I was uh, impressed by something that someone asked a grandfather once, if when you're gone, what is it that you would wish your grand grandchildren would have gotten from you that would be what you consider to be your greatest gift to them? And here's what he said. I love this, and I've adopted this myself. He said, I would wish for them, not my money or all of that other, he said, I would wish for them that when they fall down, they'll be able to get up. I, for me, that was so elegant. It's almost like saying when they're at the edge, right? They're going to be better after the edge, and they're not going to self-destruct. And they're also going to have something that people who are watching you, right, admiring you. There's a lot of people who are cynical, and, and, and they look at what you represent, and they have a cynical outlook on that. But there are other people who are watching you and admiring you. Some of them, they don't even tell you, but they're just watching you. They draw strength from the way you handle life. I would say that for me, that would be my greatest joy. I have two grandsons. Uh, I'm, and I have great grandchildren, great granddaughter, three years old, and a great grandson, three months old. I wish for them when I'm gone. I'm raising, sending up daisies from the earth. I would wish for them that when they fall, you're going to fall. That's life. You're going to fall, but they'll be able to get up. And there may be something they say, wait, well, Grandpa used to say so and so. Uh, Mama and Dad say Grandpa used to say so and so. Oh, this is an experience. It's a value of your story. It's the value of your story. And I love what uh, Benjamin Franklin said at the end. He said, well done is better than well said. It's not what we say, but what people glean from what we do. If we do the right thing, then somebody's going to want to hear about it too. That's our story. And being able to have the perseverance and just integrity and being able to push through the hard times, even though 
you may fall sometimes as long as you get back up and you're able to keep that mindset, keep God first and keep that in your heart, you can really overcome anything because I know that the Bible says I can do all things through yes. Christ who strengthens me. Yes. And so if you keep that you keep that on your mind and on your heart, that's what I took that you said you can overcome anything. There are these voices. There's a voice of judgment that looks at people and say, you ain't nothing. Or they may look at people and say, you're great. But judging, it's almost like we need a clinical way to hear what is voices are coming at us. And sometimes the voice, sometimes the Bible will talk about the voice of the devil, right? But psychologically, we can talk about the voice of fear. When, when, when an idea is, is in your head that here I am, whatever the idea is, how am I looking at where I am? It's not where I am that's going to determine where I'm going to go or when I'm going to succeed. It's the way I look at where I am. I could look at where I am and say, I'm done. There's no chance. Oh, you could look at where I am and you say, oh, I remember Grandpa told me he was once at this place. And I don't know how he got beyond it, but I know that he got beyond it and he was at a better place. That's all you need to know there. You don't need to know the specifics of the situation, but it's where were you when you thought there was no hope? There was a question I wanted to ask Nelson Mandela. I never got to ask him. This is a question I wanted to ask Mandela. And it's a question I suggest you ask your grandparents if they're still with you. They're available to you. Ask grandpa or grandma. If you're thinking now, why does grandma love me so much? Why does she love me so much? The clue is, one of the clues is, that's just ask her something. You want to know this before they leave you. Ask them because nobody will know once they're gone. I can't tell you. What is her favorite scripture? And she'll tell you. And then ask her, how, how did that play out for you, Grandma? And then ask her, favorite song. Favorite scripture and favorite song. And then the story that goes with it. Her story or his story. Grandpa's story or Grandma's story. The story of the song that goes with that will be an energy into your life that helps you to have the wings of an eagle. And you know that scripture that says, uh, uh, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. The eagle is the only other, um, 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 uh, is the only animal that lives as long as human beings. 70 years. An eagle can live 70 years. And when we understand the habitat and the habits of the eagle. They're, in, they're built in, there's nothing you can think about, it, right? So if we can be as smart as the eagle, we can do what King was trying to get at. And I'll tell you one of my favorites, if you look this up, the vision of Buckminster Fuller, one of my heroes. His vision was to make the world work for 100% of the people without ecological damage or offense to anyone, that's his vision. And the great work of Buck, Buck Mills IV, I think will guide you. If you check that out, Google uh, that name. Also with that, Google uh, Marin Anderson for different reasons. My team is involved now in creating an after-school school system, and I'm glad we're having this conversation. You young men have something that the young people behind you, even with you, will benefit from. I would say America has been asleep to who it really wants to be, who it says on paper, it says on paper that we're this great lofty place. That's not who we are yet, right? It's got to wake up and wake up and wake up. Every 50 years, there's a waking up that's going taking place. Sometimes it's a going to sleep more, not waking up. That's called the jubilee. That's part of my work. And I was given that by a man who was uh, 10 years old when the slaves were set free. A lot of what I'm telling you, he told me. The slaves, what they went through, when they were in bondage and had no way out, didn't ever think they would get out, and one day, emancipation came. And a, and a young Union soldier rode up on the plantation to give them the news and say, good news, Mr. Lincoln has done this for you all. And, and finally, the old guru looked at the soldier and said, young man, Whatever that is, you say, Mr. Lincoln, have done for us. Go back and say, thank you, Mr. Lincoln. But we know 
that is a great God Almighty to give us jubilee. That's my word. From the day I was 17 years old to this day I'm 87, I must be one of the most blessed and most luckiest people on the planet to have been blessed by those kinds of people and able to see my grandsons and my great-grandchildren and their generation, y'all can do it. Y'all can do better than we've done. And I, wherever I am when y'all uh, at my age, I'll be happy about it. I, I, I first of all, I, I want to thank you for this opportunity. This is a unique moment for me. I'm gonna ask you a question. If you had to give one word as to how you are feeling right now, what would that one word be? Enlightened. Thank you. I'd have to say, blessed.